Thank you all very much for being here. Um, for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting personally uh, previously, my name is Peter Noonan, and I'm the superintendent of schools here in the City of Falls Church, and very excited to have another round of um, sharing uh, with respect to our planning. But before we do that, I want to welcome a couple of people that are here. Um, we do have Phil Reitinger from the school board, vice chair. We also have Sh Shannon Litton is here from the school board. Uh, I saw Greg Anderson is in the house as well, and Aaron, I'm getting to everybody, I promise. Aaron Gill is here as well from the school board, and we want to thank you. Uh, before we get into the school uh, piece, though, I, and I do want to give, uh, because this is the Sunday series, and it's not just about the school, it's also about the economic development site. I want to invite the mayor up at this point. If the mayor would like to say a few words, welcome the council, and then if you'll turn it over to Mr. Shields to share his piece about the economic development. Sure, thank you so much, appreciate it. Uh, I'm Dave Tarter, Mayor of Falls Church, and I just want to welcome you all and thank you for coming out today on a rainy Sunday afternoon. Um, I would like to acknowledge and recognize my councilmates who are here. Vice Mayor Mary Beth Conley is here, some, there she is, and Letty Hardy's in the back. I think that's what we've got for today, but um, I do want to thank you. There comes Lawrence Webb, uh, Chair of the School Board as well, so welcome, Lawrence. But I want to thank you all um, for all your fine work. You know, this project keep, get, keeps getting better and better. And I think it's through community involvement, community engagement, input, and that's been our intention all along. Um, as you can see behind us, we've had a whole series of meetings and there's more to go. We want to make sure that um, we put as much information out as possible, but more importantly, get input from you all to make this project all it can be. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, we made a ton of progress in this past year. I mean, think about where we started a year ago or so and where we are today. So there's still miles to go before we sleep, but uh, uh, some great work's been done. I look forward to hearing more from you all. So thanks very much, and I'm going to let Wyatt Shields take over from here. Wyatt? Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wyatt Shields, and as the mayor said, I'll just provide a, a short, about a five-minute update for everybody on the work that we're doing on the uh, West Falls Church Economic Development Project, which is uh, the project that is running parallel to the school design uh, project. And we'll spend most of our time today on the school design. Um, but as, as the mayor said, we've been having a rolling series of, of these Sunday town halls on this project. The next one is the third Sunday in October, and that will be on the 21st. So uh, keep, uh, keep plugged into this uh, process as we go forward and keep planning. So um, with the economic development piece of it, a lot of the backdrop of the reason we're taking 10 acres of the campus property, the land actually that we're, we're standing on right now, to take that to, to market uh, for private economic development is to help us mitigate the cost to the taxpayers of a brand new state-of-the-art high school. The voters approved last November $120 million of debt to be issued by the City of Falls Church for this high school. The annual debt service for that is about $6 million uh, per year based on some of the assumptions that are shown up on this slide. That would be over a 30-year uh, debt obligation. That's about 15 cents on the tax rate to meet that debt service obligation. So with economic development, our goal is to mitigate and lower that cost for the taxpayers, and at the same time, do some placemaking, bring in amenities and design, shared parking, shared amenities that will actually grow the community and benefit the community, as well as help us pay our bills. That's, that's what we've been working on for the past several years, and, and we're um, taking our steps now to implement that plan. So here, um, this chart has a lot of words on it, but if you sort of break it down, it's three columns. Uh, the column on the left are dates, and the middle column are big sort of key steps in our process for the school, high school design, and the column on the right are the key steps for their economic development. So we have been moving through these processes. The school was the first to issue its request for proposals for design, and that process resulted in the selection of the Gilbain uh, construction and Stantec Evans Quill design team. Um, the city issued a request for proposals to the private sector for 10 acres of development. That was issued uh, first in, uh, in March and then a request for detailed proposals in June. Uh, we received proposals in, uh, in, uh, in August and we're right now evaluating those proposals. They're being done under the Virginia uh, Public Private and Education Facilities Act, and we are required by law to keep a lot of the financial information in those proposals confidential 
to protect their um, uh, confidential material, but also to protect the city's negotiating position. Uh, but we do have executive summaries, and I plan to show those to you today. What we're all working towards is in May 2019, about seven months from now, uh, we want to have finalized a comprehensive agreement with our developer partner, and at the same time, we'll finalize the contract um, uh, for the design of the school, and then immediately after that, we would issue the bonds for the construction of the school. But we want to have that economic development agreement executed before we take on the significant liabilities of the debt for the high school. That's been our planning principle uh, from the beginning. Uh, it's a two-year construction process, um, and the school uh, is intended to be open in 2021. Um, during that two-year period is when the private developer will be getting their site plan approval, get their financing. Um, the new school would open, and then the economic development construction would begin uh, like in the summer or fall of 2021. So that's the overall schedule that we're working on. So uh, as I mentioned, we've, we issued a request for detailed proposals for the economic development. We received two proposals. Um, we had down-selected the six initial people who put in down to three. Um, and of those three that were invited to participate in the, in the detailed round, uh, two did so. Their executive summaries are posted on the city's webpage. But here's sort of a, a quick overview of what has been proposed. Uh, the EYA, PN Hoffman, and Regency team has a site plan that is basically um, uh, aligned here with the new high school, which Gilbane and Stantec are designing. Uh, but the 10-acre site would have a promenade in the middle, uh, a mixed-use project here, office here, hotel and civic space here. And then this is a phase two uh, concept um, in this area with office and, uh, and condos. Uh, this project does feature a shared parking deck, and that's uh, shared parking is something that we're working through the details on, and there's obviously going to be a lot of details to be worked out on that, uh, but that is the way that the EYA team has uh, put forward that proposal. Um, so some of the features of it, um, their, their retail would be anchored with a grocer um, and food uses. Uh, they have approximately 391,000 square feet of, of office space, uh, some of that coming in the sec second phase. Um, a hotel, uh, approximately 288 apartments, uh, 245 condos, uh, 31 affordable housing units. They have a senior housing component to the project and approximately an acre of open space, and that's that central promenade that I described earlier. Uh, the other proposal is uh, from the Rushmark HIT team. Um, their layout uh, has um, an office building on this corner, um, multifamily in these components. Um, they have a hotel fronting on Broad Street. Their plaza or open space is on the back here, and they have that tied in uh, with a proposal that they've submitted to Virginia Tech concurrently to their proposal to us. Virginia Tech, upon receipt of this proposal from Rushmark, which was an unsolicited proposal from Virginia Tech's perspective, they then issued a, an invitation to others to provide uh, pr proposals for the redevelopment of the Northern Virginia Center. And I'll just note, uh, WMATA also is going through a rezoning and comp plan amendment for its approximately 24 acres around the West Falls Church Metro site. Um, for both of our neighbors, we've been speaking with them for a matter of years to tell them about our plans, and we've encouraged them to think progressively about their future opportunities on their property as well, and they're doing that. Um, and we're, we're not coordinating on the details uh, yet, but we will be doing a whole lot more. As they, These are big institutions. They have to go through kind of all of their internal decision making, uh, but we've encouraged them to join us in planning for the site at the same time. Uh, the Rushmark site, um, about 148,000 uh, square feet of, of retail space, uh, anchored by a grocer and a gym, uh, 150,000 square feet of office, um, a hotel, approximately 750 apartments, 120 condos, 57 affordable units, and uh, three quarters of an acre of open space in the Rushmark proposal. So again, these are just uh, high-level summaries. These are available on the city website. 
We have an evaluation committee that's meeting right now that's composed of school board, city council, planning commission, economic development authority, um, and staff uh, members on that evaluation committee. And we have a commercial real estate advisor uh, that's working with us as we consider how to, how to evaluate these properties, uh, these, these uh, proposals. There are basically three big areas that we're working on in terms of our evaluation. Uh, one is what is the value to the city and the detailed proposals they need to present what they would pay for the land and what that deal structure would look like. Uh, we're evaluating on the quality of the development program and we're evaluating it on uh, the execution and risk components to their project. How feasible do their projects look? One other note, um, and, and we've mentioned this in, in the last meeting that we had, but we have received a grant from the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. Uh, many of you perhaps in this room helped lobby the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority for this grant, but it's approximately $15.7 million in funds that will help us uh, make the site more walkable, improve access to uh, the site, improve throughput through the Haycock Road uh, Route 7 intersection. Those are some of the kind of the key components of what we intend to use those grant funds for. So that's the, uh, what I wanted to provide an update for. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't know, Peter, whether we're doing questions now, whether we should wait to the end of your presentation. Yeah. So we're going to turn it over for school design in just a moment before I give up the lectern. Any questions for me? Yeah, we'll go here and then there. Yes. Hi, I'm County resident. right over Welcome. What's the, thank you. What's the connection with the county government and the people who live nearby to our county residents? So we are working with county staff on our planning. We've, we've been keeping them informed every step of the way. Um, the county board was helpful to us to, in getting the NVTA grant that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, and so we're, we're trying to, to, to do all of our planning together, and particularly the transportation impacts. Uh, we need to go through VDOT for what's called an 870 review for, uh, for our rezoning for the 10-acre site, and that's being done in close coordination with Fairfax County so that they know, um, you know what it is, what kind of densities and things like that we're proposing. Um, but we want uh, Fairfax County neighbors to be able to walk to this site safely and easily, and we want to try to mitigate any tra traffic Im impacts on our neighbors as well. Yes. Um, I'm Chris Thompson. Um, so the, the city authorized, it's a little bit of a complicated financial question, so I'm just figure where you want to take it, but the um, city authorized $120 million bond referendum to pay for the high school. Right? The city, so far as I know, did not authorize the 10 acre lands to help to offset that $120 million. Um, we're doing that because it makes good financial sense from a financial management perspective. Can you tell us how much of that $120 million is being collected by the 10 acre well, um, I can't yet because we're still in the, in the middle of our, our discussions with proposers. So um, that's still to be seen. In our planning, and what we described in the referendum, is that approximately two-thirds of the cost of the, of the bonds, if, per our modeling, um, is what we were shooting for in terms of mitigation of cost to the taxpayers. So about one-third uh, will need to be uh, paid for. Uh, by the taxpayers, about two-thirds were hoping to have uh, the debt service be take care, taken care of through economic development. That all remains to be seen. I think we're on a good track, um, but uh, we've got a lot of steps to go through before we've confirmed that. Mm -hmm. Why Correct. Um, and, and we've stated a preference for lease, and the proposers have responded, um, you, you know, with, uh, with the, that as a feasible option. Yes, Corey. Uh, why did the third um, group of the select not respond to the RFP? Um, the, uh, we were told, we were informed by them that they were not going to respond. And their reasoning simply was they just, in terms of the number of projects they already had in queue, that was the reason that they gave us. Um, and, uh, but we have two very good competitive proposals, so we're, we're pleased with the, with the process that we have. One concern that I've seen there is that the 
development agencies not leverage the school as a crutch, saying this is separate from the schools. What it comes down to is this misuse of the school's parking that basically we're trying to extend beyond. I would rather, I love the idea of mixed use parking. I didn't see any parking in the second one. I'm sure it's in the but I would love to see mixed use parking as part of that 10 acres. Uh, but what I saw there was an encroachment beyond the 10 acres. So I think I have a good perspective of that. If you're going to have a bunch of businesses, you're going to have a bunch of people there at the same time as school. Uh, so the question is about shared parking, and, and we will expect that the development community is going to take care of the parking on their own site. The question is, is to what extent um, can we have, uh, you know, for football games, prom night, for graduation, for big events, uh, can we have shared parking uh, on the private development side? Uh, we've got a lot of work to do in that area, and, and I think we're going to make progress in that. But all these details, I think, are, you know, we've, we, we need to work those out. But, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yes? Um, the, uh, the two do take a slightly different approaches on parking. Underground is certainly a... a you know, is something the city likes. It's very expensive, um, and so there are trade-offs with it. But as you'll see around the city, typically for our more dense developments that have been approved in the last 10 years in the city, most of the parking has been underground. Um, and so that's, that is a, uh, something that the city does appreciate. And I think the private developers are all very keen to what, if their project is going to be viable in the marketplace, it needs to be adequately parked. And, and they have a very keen eye towards that as well. Um, so, um, so one thing that I should say about this process, um, our, the city's intention is to um, execute an interim agreement with the top-ranked proposer. Uh, then the top rank proposal will have a due diligence period, but they'll also submit an application for the zoning and the special exception approvals that would be needed for the site. That will be a very public uh, process that we're all familiar with. That will go for all of our boards and commissions. It will uh, have formal recommendations from the planning commission um, and lots of public comment on it. And so once we get to that step, I think we'll have a much more fulsome discussion with the community about the details of of how this all is going to, uh, the private side is going to work. Yeah, Christine, and then uh, here. And, uh, what the impact is of all the housing on this property, as well as uh, what that would have in terms of the impact for our schools? We are doing, uh, so the question is about the school generation from, uh, from the site. And so um, we will be, we're doing that analysis right now, and uh, we'll have those numbers soon for the public. Um, obviously, anytime you have a residential use, there are impacts on the schools. Um, we have been factoring into our school capital planning the expectation that this 10-acre site was going to have a residential component to it, and so we're sizing our school facilities with that in mind. Um, but um, that's something I think we're always sensitive to. Um, the development team has a firm use of the land. Um, correct. If they have a So the question is, on terms of the land transaction structure, the city's preferred structure would be a land lease so that uh, the land would revert back to the city uh, at the end of that lease. Uh, typically, for investment of this scale, a 99-year lease is, is what would be market standard. Uh, that's a kind of part of the confidential aspect of it so now, but that will become public soon. Okay, uh, so we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to get the hook now, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Noonan.
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Shields. It was very um, helpful. And obviously, um, as Mr. Shields was talking, you can clearly see sort of the synergy between the two projects and the importance of both of them sort of being on the same track together and moving through um, seamlessly. So, so today, um, our plan with the school is to kind of follow a similar uh, process to what we did the last time in that we would do a presentation uh, and then we're going to do some breakouts following those presentations. And, um, one of the, the things we really hope that you're able to see today is that um, we've, we, um, not we as in me, as in um, the design team, um, Quinn Evans and Stantec and also Gil Bain have really been listening to um, the feedback in each of these sessions. So what they're going to share today are some modifications to the plans that have been made based on the feedback we've received. Um, so uh, when I turn it over to um, Bill Bradley here in just a second, he's going to kind of walk you through some of those changes and some of the things that we've heard in the community. There are a couple of things, though, that I want to say you're not going to see today. Um, and one is a solution to the parking <laughs> that came up today again. Um, here's, here's where we are with parking, and I'll just give you a little bit of information about that uh, for the moment, because this is the best information we have right now. We recognize that parking is a concern or a question that keeps coming up. Um, we, we believe at this point we're able to achieve about 380 parking spaces on the site, which is significantly more than we had originally had um, identified. At first we had about 335, 340. But because of the potential move of our buses to another site, um, we're able to capture some of that space and now have 380 80 spaces. That's 50 less than what we currently have. We currently have 430 spaces on the combined site. Um, so there's a couple of things in that that I want to make sure everybody's aware of. The, the 380 spaces is sufficient for parking us during the day. It takes care of all of our students, most of our students, not all of our students because we do have some juniors that drive, um, but it takes care of most of our students, it takes care of all of our staff. What it doesn't create is an opportunity for after hours parking when we have large events. And we totally understand that and we're totally on it. And I want, to, I want you to know that that's one of the things that I'm most excited about in terms of the synergy between the economic development piece and the school side is how are we going to be able to share some parking um, and pick up some spaces. Because I'm confident um, through this process that we're going to be equal to or better than what we currently are. So we need to pick up 50, at least 50 spaces in the, new, um, in the new design between the two sites together. So there isn't going to be a solution to the parking problem. So in an effort to try to be as efficient with our time today, if you wouldn't mind limiting your comments about parking and know that we get it, <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, some other things that I, I want to make sure that you recognize in the presentation that you're going to hear today, too, is we heard you loudly and clearly about some of the safety and security issues associated with the high school. And Bill's going to talk about some of those as well. The last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Bill is I, I also feel as your superintendent of schools that it's my responsibility in some ways to sort of manage expectation. And I want to make sure that everybody's really clear that we are, we are going to be building on a really compact site. And that's the reason that we've gone vertical versus horizontal. Um, we're building a state-of-the-art high school that's going to have everything we need plus more, um, but it's not going to have everything we want plus more. And so part of our challenge in this process to, is to recognize what do we need and what do we want and how do we try to blend those as best we can to get to as many things as possible, but also recognizing that we have this site that is, in a cert, to a certain degree, restricted in terms of its vertical nature. So as Bill talks today, he's going to do the sort of play-by-play, -play, and as he's doing that, I may jump in and say a couple of things about some of the spaces that he's talking about, just to give you a sense of where we are with some of these bigger issues that have come up in the community. So, um, so help me with that, um, and, and please do understand that um, we are working as diligently as we can to get everything possible onto the site but also recognizing that it is a limited site as well. So um, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Bill uh, Bradley from, um, from Stantec, and Bob Sherrill is also here, and uh, they're going to take you through this. So thanks. Thank you, and good afternoon. And oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. While Bob is changing out the slide, I want to do a little housekeeping. So if you have some notes and you've signed up for some of the breakouts after this presentation, I'll give you the room numbers. So for athletics, it's D104. Academics, D106. Community use, D126. 
Sustainability, 128. Performing Arts, 131. So I'm making note of that. Thanks. So um, thank you very much for coming here. It's really nice to see everybody. My name is Bill Bradley. I'm an architect and educational planner with Stantec. And since we last met with you, we have been meeting with, with other folks to, to gather, to synthesize, to prioritize with the help of leadership um, the different input that you've been providing to us. It's been very helpful. Um, the groups that we've met with, I think you are familiar with some of them. Most recently, we met with your admin, your guidance, and your athletics to work through a few things. But here's just a list of all the ones that folks with whom we've met. And I just want to put that up here and give you a moment to look at it, because I think it's important to understand that your key stakeholders are providing input as we refine the program and adjust the design to reflect that new program. So just take a moment to see the groups that are being presented here. It's very it's small. Kind of hard to read. It's very small. All right. So I hadn't seen that before like that. So the short answer is everybody. Um, and I, I say that tongue in cheek, but it really has been very comprehensive. We've been having about six or seven meetings a week, um, hour long meetings with different stakeholders who've brought their input, their expertise to bear on this project, both looking at plans and ideas we've had, but providing their own. Uh, it's been very helpful for us. It's been very eye-opening. And as you'll see, and what we're going to do in a second here is walk you through the plans, the site plan, and all the building plans to show how the feedback that we're receiving has been incorporated. So we're going to do that. Dirk Jeffrey, who's the principal in charge of the architecture with Stantec, is going to come up and walk you through that. But before he does, I want to share with you some of the, the key messages that we think we heard from you. And I'm not going to parrot everything that you said in our last breakouts or all the things that were on the sticky, but I just want to highlight a couple of things for each of the groups that we heard and give you some cues to look for as we walk through the plans. So for academics, what we heard loud and clear is that you're doing some very innovative things here. But to some degree, the building is limiting your options. And that as you take those to the new building and, and begin to do new and other things, that you want a wide variety of differentiated spaces to support differentiated learning. And then we also heard that as much as that's true and very specific, you don't want the building to paint you into a corner. So what you'll see when we go through the plans for the academics in particular is a wide variety of spaces to support a wide variety of activities. And you'll also see that the building is laid out on a very regular grid, that the classroom module, which can be doubled to reflect a flex lab or cut in half for breakout spaces or individual study, is laid out in that way so that you can change the building in the future, that it can evolve as, can't hear me? I'm sorry. How about if I just grab it and take it up? Is that better? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Nobody wanted to admit it. I want to admit that I can't see you right now. I don't have my glasses on. So anyway, it's a regular grid and provides flex flexibility over time, which I think is very important. For athletics, um, you wanted a wide variety of spaces, amenities, certainly upgrades on what you have, but more than what you have better and you wanted access not just for your athletes but for your fans and also those who were visiting and then you wanted to reflect the spirit of George Mason and you'll see that in everything from Mustang Way to the Hall of Fame that's been space that's been provided for that and so as you look through there particularly on the first floor you'll see a, a highly articulated locker room plan that with the help of Julie reflects a balance between um, the seasons, the sports, gender equity, everything from where do the officials go at halftime of the football games in the fall, four times a year, and how do they shower afterwards? And so with her help, nine, they come here nine times? Well, at any rate, they've got a place to shower. Five, okay. They have a place to shower. Um, ways to accommodate multiple events on the fields, and in the building at the same time and provide clear separation, access, and control. And then, of course, places to um, curate the fan experience and promote your legacy. Very similar ideas for community use that you expressed. Wanting to have the building and the site accessible to the community. And when it's accessible, making sure that the access is controlled and safe. And then continuing the legacy that you have here at George Mason. So what you'll see is a wide variety of, of venues for the community to use, be it outside or inside. In fact, the second floor, as Dirk Jeffrey will talk about, is, is a living room for the school, but it's also a living room for Falls Church. And the ways in which the 
we have strategically placed control points to permit or limit access to those spaces as appropriate. And then places around the campus and in the school to accommodate your legacy items that you've shared with us. Performing arts, we heard loud and clear you don't like the black box on the second floor. Gone. Downstairs now with the performing arts suite, so you see a, a collective performing arts suite. Um, that there was a desire, actually I think this was expressed by the teachers, for a keyboarding and recording studio. Okay, that's in there now. And then the idea of trying to optimize the experience for both the patrons and the performers. And so you'll see all that when we talk about the auditorium, you'll see that we're trying to balance the area for the stage, the orchestra pit, the support spaces in the wings, and the seats for the patrons. Sustainability was a big one, and you've talked about your desire to limit not only the cost to operate the facility, but also its environmental footprint. Um, the desire to model best practices, and what we interpret that to mean was that as the kids are studying sustainability in their textbooks, and they're being taught these, that you want the building to f reflect those best practices. You don't want the building to be a contradiction to what it is they're learning. And then a commitment to lead. And so when you see the building, you'll see everything from, and we're not, you're not gonna see geothermal systems, but they are there. You'll see the building has been cranked to orient more, more north, more appropriate orientation. Um, and you'll note, and you won't see it, but you should note that there is a commitment to lead gold and to pursue net zero ready, net zero energy ready facilities. And then lastly, safety and security. Um, Concerns about limiting access to the building, concerns about the ability to lock down the building, and then there were concerns about bullets penetrating glass in the building. And so what you'll see is a, a very strategic approach to access to the building, okay? Limiting people into the building, controlling them, and then once they're in their building, if it ever has to happen, the ability to lock the building down very quickly in a way that segregates the students and provides safe egress from the building. And then there is strategic location of bulletproof glazing, and you'll see also um, shelter and concealment places. So with that, I'd like to invite Dirk Jeffrey up, and he and I are gonna walk you through these plans. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're very excited to share with you the refinements, the improvements, the changes, the modifications that we're making to the design, the design being the concept of design that was submitted four months ago. And everything that we're going to share with you today has taken place over the last six or eight weeks in parallel to and in response to the feedback that we received from all of these stakeholder meetings. So this is happening very quickly. A lot of it's taking place very quickly, and yet we feel very good about where we are based on the feedback that we've received. It's a very large, complex, building, and yet things are shaking out very well, and I'll, and I'll walk you through quickly. In the past, we've ta talked about design primarily in terms of 3D. We've talked about the videos, the animations. All of the floor plans of the concept have been on the website. Today, I want to talk about the current floor plans relative to the concept floor plan. It can be difficult in a floor plan to visualize space, and yet that's what we're going to ask you to do. And so we'll go quickly, and at a subsequent Sunday series meeting, will be able to present the revised design three-dimensionally, but that's not where we are today. The site plan you've seen before, this is the consolidated athletic complex that we're creating behind Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, and the two parallel bars at the top are the, what we call the thin and the wide bar of the four-story and five-story portions of the high school. Nothing's changed here, actually. We are looking at ways of developing this to optimize parking, car parking, as Dr. Nuna mentioned earlier. And those rectangles over there will look something more like Mr. Shields shared with us earlier about the private development. The one thing I do want to uh, point out, Bill, if you would, it's subtle. Take a look at the fat bar. This is how it was, and this is where we're proposing it today. A very subtle shift to the north, and what that does is it provides more a more gracious entry right here, and it does reduce the square footage back at the back where we probably didn't need it. Again, it was a concept, it was an idea about a public space from front to back. The idea is still there, 
but the space is given where it's needed more than where it's not. The other thing that it does is it does move the building away. If you would just go back, Bill. Again, the concept got very close to your concession building, and today, by moving it, we actually do open that up a little bit. Very subtle. If I didn't point it out, you wouldn't know it in the end when it's built. Four degrees is very difficult to discern uh, once it's in place. So that's where we are today with the building. All the building plans that you see today will show a four degree cant of the wider bar. It is, it's, it's, it's orienting the building to the north, which will actually help with, with some of the concerns about glare that were raised as well. So this is the lowest level. Last time we talked, we presented a zoning diagram that went from the lowest level all the way to the top level, where functional areas are distributed throughout the building from bottom to top, none of that has changed. So we're at the very lowest level where locker rooms would exit directly to the athletic stadium. None of, this is where we were, and as Bill mentioned, the uh, violet area, that is the performing arts suite. You'll see that it was, it's still there. All of the locker rooms have been worked through with Julie and her staff. But what we have right now in the performing arts suite is the black box. If you recall in the concept, the black box was on the second floor. The vertical volume that's available for the black box on the second floor is not as much as if, it was if we put it here. There's 24 feet available to us in volume. So in terms of the rigging, the lighting, and so forth, we can make a much more robust black box by bringing it down here. We co-locate that with, that with the rest of the performing arts suite. And as Bill mentioned earlier, we added, we found space for one additional instructional space. Flexible music lab, keyboard lab, sound editing, all of that will be co-located at the lower level. You said we wouldn't see geothermal. Here's the geothermal pump room right here. <laughs> okay. You have to go back one slide. This, the locker rooms at the concept level, the locker rooms exited directly up to the gym. Today, those central stairs have been put to the corners. They serve the entire floor, so students would leave the locker room, exit the stair, go up to the gymnasium level, and up again to the running track, and we'll show that. So it gets the stairs out of the way of that public promenade that came around the uh, top side of the building. So we had, we had a thing in the way. That thing was in the way. And now that thing's out of the way. This was the gymnasium level before the gymnasium level today. And here's where you can really see where the wedge might make a little bit more sense. So still we have exactly the same amount of space in front of the gym, and we just take away a little bit of space down at the back side, outside the auxiliary gym. This is the area that would overlook from above into the black box. So if you can imagine being there after hours attending an athletic event or some other event at the gymnasium level, perhaps at halftime, you go around the corner, hey, what's going on in the black box? So it's a way of connecting performing arts spaces to other public spaces in the building. That's hard to pull off sometimes in a high school, but given the verticality, the vertical nature of your, design, of your school, we're looking for every opportunity to connect one space to another. That's how we're doing it here, proposing to do it here. This is the main level to the school. We must connect our serving area to the middle school. Remember, that was a primary idea of the concept. One kitchen, a combined kitchen, two serving lines. Separate serving line for the high school, separate serving line for the middle school. So we have to match this elevation at the dining room. But then we step up a little bit to create more volume in the dining room and connect it back then to that heart of the school. So that's where we were. Very little change today to any of this, except for one gigantic move. So if you would just go back. Before, when we came in, and you may recall from the videos, when you came in, there was a stair that invited you up to the media center. A little bit further down, there was a stair that invited you down to the gymnasium. So after hours, I could go up to the library, I could go down to the gymnasium. Where do the students go? How do the students move up and down? So in our opinion, one of the flaws of the concept was gracious, inviting, 
movement of students up and down all day long. So we didn't, we have plenty of stairs. Which one is the one that you would choose? We felt that the design suffered in that way. And so today, we have created where we had the heart of the school, we now have the spine. And this large central stair is the way up and down. Very open, and so here's the idea. I'm, I'm looking, I'm cutting right through the heart of the school, and I'm looking back toward the middle school. So here's the entry lobby, here's the main office. I can come in and I can go down and I'm in that, that same volume of the gym lobby. Overlooking the cafeteria from above, right? And then I can, I can move, I can get to the second level. I can't go through those doors if it's after hours. If you don't want me to get into the library, I can't get in. And then the stair goes all the way up at the third level. It connects to the roof for outdoor learning and it goes all the way up. Okay, so let's go. So this is the idea about the learning stair looking the other way. It goes all the way to the locker rooms. But again, you come in the front door, you traverse the heart of the school, connect to the spine of the school. That is one major move that we made to the design to improve student movement throughout the school. This was the second level before, and this is the other area of major, major move. Before, the guidance was on the second floor, but right above the, uh, I said guidance, counseling, right above the main office, and throughout the meetings, we have learned that guidance, counseling, and administration, the real synergy now, they're going to be on the third floor, you'll see that in a moment, where a consolidated student services suite then is right adjacent to the students that they serve. So rather than being on the first floor and students being on three, four, and five, the student services suite is now on level three. What that does, and by getting the black box to the uh, to the lowest level, it opens all of this together with the makerspace and the broadcast studio. All of this is now the community, community-oriented living room. So this is not yet designed, but this will be one of the most vibrant and exciting public community spaces in the building. We're very, very excited about the opportunity of the second floor. <clears throat> There is an element in the program for a meeting room, a classroom connected to the media center. Where we're locating it now, we're proposing to locate it, is right over the front door. So when I come in, I have to pass through a vestibule, secure vestibule, 16 feet above me is the floor. On top of that is what could be a community meeting room. It's a program area for media center, but after hours, it's very convenient for a community meeting room. So if you can imagine coming to your school and seeing all of this activity from all the way across, I mean, what, a, what I think would be a very, very inviting, inviting entry to your school. This was the third level prior, and then levels three, four, and five will go very quickly. So again, here's the stair coming up. This is the learning stair, if you remember from the video, that double height, that amphitheater, that's right there. And so this area in pink, that is the consolidated student services suite. That's, those are the counselors and the uh, assistant principals as well. Everything that's in light blue is academic space. So as we move up, let me talk about a couple of the moves that have been made in response to concerns about security. So the stair, as I mentioned earlier, we want, there's a balance between making it inviting and, and limiting access up and down the building. So the idea right now is not to have doors at the main level, but if I got to the second floor, I can't go any further. At every level, I can't, get it, I can't access that level once I'm in that stair. If I'm, at, if I'm in the gym lobby, I can certainly, from the first floor, I can see who's down there because it's a straight shot, line of sight, very direct. Once I'm at this level, 
Each of these wings, they're not showing yet, each of these wings will be entirely secure from this core, the central core area. And so by design, we can provide early warning, transparency, eyes on the street, glass visibility, provides early warning if trouble's coming. The other thing that we can do is we can create areas of refuge. So air, safe areas, barriers, as Bill mentioned earlier, that limit access. So floor by floor or sections within a floor can be controlled so that I can't get through, I can't get in. Once you're in, if you are to shelter in place, then there are areas, these green areas are going to be student breakout areas where you'll see where classrooms can come to here and an adjoining classroom can exit through a classroom and students could actually uh, be safe in an interior space that doesn't communicate with the hallway. So we're still working out the details of those rooms, but we are trying to create, in response to the emergency management uh, concerns, concealment and cover, strategies for both. And then also pathways for escape. So any, from anywhere in the building, you can easily also get out of the building. So that's where we are at the moment, and I think that wraps it up. Oh, good. Thank you. And so here we are on the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth floor. And if you just look at this red area right here, levels five, levels four, levels three, they're all exactly the same. Each level provides a central space with workstations for 20 staff by floor, a conference area, toilets, a wellness space, kitchen, storage, and a stair. So that regardless of where you're teaching and where your office might be, you can easily enter that space and then move up. So collaboration for learning is important, but collaboration for professionals is equally important. So you'll have a private space to go if you were in a situation where your classroom was shared. At the fifth floor and at the third level, we also have terraces for outdoor learning. So to Bill's point earlier about a variety of learning spaces, this is where we are at this point in the process. I'm tired, <laughs> talking very quickly. Um, I think we're there, right? Learning stair, rooftop. I think we're there. Questions now or afterward? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wonder with all the, the cost on um, the needs of the Yeah, I, I had mentioned that at a Sunday series a while back. We continue to look for grant funding, um, not unlike sort of the transportation grant that the city uh, general government received. We continue to look for grants. Uh, the Department of Justice put one out not too long ago. We kind of are looking at, um, but typically those grants are not necessarily for hardening of schools. They're more for programmatic things like um, psychologist, psychologist uh, services, um, school counselor services and the like, which are equally important. Um, but oftentimes they're for school resource officers and they'll often pay for school resource officers. So, but w long story short is we are definitely looking at that. So, thanks. Right, yeah. So we, we do feel like um, this, this sort of, th brings together some safety pieces that have been brought up a number of times. And I think that limiting and sort of um, stopping people from being able to go up and down is really an important component to this design. If you think about, and, and this, is, this is sort of not an epiphany for me, but something that sort of came up the other day that just sort of made sense. So this staircase, as described as sort of the spine, like as a vertical spine of a human being, when we're building vertically as opposed to horizontally, when we're in a horizontal building, we try to cordon off areas, sections. Now instead, we're trying to cordon them off vertically. And so this design, this spine allows us to do that. So we're excited about that. I, I want to, yes? Out of the room, the flow of the water, the flow, are we just 
Well, I think there's, there's a number of, well, I'll let you answer it. First of all, there are a number of different, there's still other stairwells that students can use, but these are very generous stairways. How wide is the stairway? 10, 10 feet wide, up and down. Um, and having worked personally in a high school that had three floors previously as a principal, with 24, 2,400 students, the stairwell, that main stairwell was sufficient for 2,400, and it was a similar width as this one. So when we look at 1,500 students over five floors as opposed to 2,400 over three, um, I think that this, is, this space is really sufficient and quite generous as well. Yeah, yeah the two end stairwells will also provide additional. And then we do have um, two, three, right now we're building out for three elevators. We'll end up having probably start with two elevators depending on what, we, what our needs are. So there'll be multiple ways to get up and down the floors. All right, I do want to give you a chance to break out. Before you do that though, um, I do want to just say a couple more things just in terms of the context of this site and as you get into the breakout. One, there are a couple things that we've heard from the community um, that I want to uh, give some information about. And the first is, um, on the practice field, on the, uh, there's been a lot of synergy and questions about um, the potential for lighting. We are absolutely, we would like to have lighting on those fields as well. Um, and so we are committed to trying to find a way to get lighting on those, uh, that practice field because we know that it can be a great use for us as a community down the line. Um, again, it's a matter of trade-offs, but trying to figure out how we might be able to do that is something that we're committed to, committed to doing. I love kids. <laughs> I just love them. Um, the second thing that I want to uh, talk about just very briefly is there's been a couple of folks that have raised a concern or question about a full fly system in the theater um, where, okay, thanks. Um, because it's a vertical space, we're not going to be able to do a full fly system. Um, but we, what we are going to do as, uh, and we've been talking with Sean a lot, who's the theater arts teacher here at the high school, is trying to um, look at what they're doing in Broadway productions now, which are technological solutions to fly systems. And so we're working on trying to find other solutions. There may be enough room for a partial fly, uh, where some rolled sets will also provide some rigging that would allow for that as well. Um, but a full fly in this compressed five-story space just doesn't look like it's going to be a possibility. Um, but we'll, we'll try to figure out some other solutions. Um, parking I already addressed. Um, I know there are other issues that have come up. L Lindy? Uh, when are we going to be in the stage where we talk about materials? Yeah. Floor materials, stair materials, outside? So we, we will get to that um, probably in the next five to six months. Um, what we'll do is we'll get a committee of folks together, not unlike we do for, uh, like we did for Mount Daniel Elementary School, it'll be teachers, some community members and the like, who will come together and talk about some of those flooring materials as well. Uh, but we're going to get there. Let's get the design. I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Let's get this design first. Um, so just as a reminder for breakouts, um, athletics is in D104, academics in D106, community use in D126, sustainability in 128, fine and performing arts in 131. Here's what we're going to do when we come back, is we're going to put up the charts from the work that was done in those breakout spaces here, and we'll do a gallery walk and everybody will have an opportunity to see what each of the groups wrote down, and we'll give you a, a process by which you can also comment on that. So um, is there anything else? Mary Beth. Okay, 106, 104, 106 are here, and the others are down this direction. Um, so, yes, sir. Um, we did not do a security or a parking breakout this time because we're going to try to cut through all of those in each of these other breakouts. Because those were two topics that came across in each of the, each of the, the breakout sessions. All right. Thanks, and we'll see you back here. Uh, what do we say? 3.50? About 350. Thank you. On behalf of the city manager and myself, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, and participating again in the feedback session. My hope is that it's evident that we're listening, that we're, we're taking your feedback and we're refining and tweaking the design 
based on the feedback that we're receiving from you. Um, I also want to say thank you for those of you that put some sticky notes in the blank strengths boxes over here, because I know that there are some strengths uh, in all of these. We tend to sometimes, I think, focus on the negative uh, or the challenges or the, or the um, weaknesses, but I um, do want to thank you for that. We, we have two more um, big community events um, around this work, and the next one is this week um, on Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday, I should double check. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a joint PTA meeting. Um, so the elementary and secondary middle, uh, middle and high school PTAs are gonna come together and we'll be here at George Mason in the auditorium um, this time to do the presentation. This presentation will look very similar to today, but we won't have the breakouts. And then we have one more final community engagement around the, the follow-up from this work that's gonna happen in October. That date is um, yet to be determined, but as soon as we have that date, we'll give it to all of you. The, the GMHS High School email that many of you have been responding to continues to remain open. I got some feedback, there was some real-time feedback even today as I was sitting in one of the sessions, somebody, somebody sent an email to that address, thank you. Um, so we'll continue to take that and we, we are intent upon making sure that we get all of the questions answered so that we all feel good moving forward. Um, and, and so again, just want to say thank you for coming out today. It's a little after four and we did promise a four o'clock end time. Um, so we will, we will end now, but again, if you want to take a few more minutes looking at this, please feel free. Otherwise, we'll see you at our next engagement. Um, thank you all for coming and being here. Have a great afternoon.